Okay, welcome back. Okay, so Lucy has asked a question, very interesting question. She said, what if, what if God shows the way and the child doesn't want to? So I suppose God is showing the parents about a person, but the child doesn't want to marry them. I think that's what your question is, Lucy. I hope I've uh, got that right. Okay, yes. So um, the choice of who to marry should be with the person who's getting married. So even as you as a parent may, may sense or may feel that someone uh, is, is uh, suitable for your daughter or for your son, having that conversation and letting them know why you sense God is showing you something is important to discuss with your child. But the final decision should be with the child. Like we said, God is a God um, who gives each one of us a free will to make choices, even when our choices are not very good, even when our choices are not right. Uh, but God still gives us a free will. Uh, and so I think it is always better to follow that principle. Yes, yeah, so discussing it with your child and showing them why you sense that God has showed you a person, but at the end of it, allowing your child to make that decision uh, is the mature thing to do. I hope that answers it, Lucy. <coughs> All right, so we're going to look at the next section of how do we seek a person to get married? How do we seek? So let's read a couple of scriptures. Matthew 7, 7 to 10. Can someone online please read it, please? Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 10. Somebody online can read it? Can I read, sister? Go ahead, go ahead, Gertrude. Matthew 7, 7 to 10. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks will receive and anyone who seeks will find. And the door will be opened to those who knock. Would any of you who are fathers give your son a stone when he asks for bread? Or would you give him a snake when he asks for fish? Okay, thank you. As bad as you are, you know Oops. how to give good things to your children. How much more then will your father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Okay, so in our thank you, Gertrude. So in our let's let's uh, look at the way that we may seek things from God. What does God ask us to do? Ask. Seek, knock, right? That's what we we are asked to do. So even with marriage, when we are asking, seeking, knocking, we also trust God that He will guide us in that decision to find the most suitable person that is there for us. So again, I, again, I think it's important for us to know that the right person that God brings us to is not the perfect person. And, I, and the question that uh, Diksha asked is, uh, what if you have got married thinking, or you, you know that it is God's will, and after marriage there's a whole lot of problems. Are you going to question God's will? Or are you really going to question to see if something is going wrong in the way that you're relating to one another? Right? So when who God leads you to finally becomes the right person. They may not be the perfect one, or they may not have all the things met, but God is leading you to someone where you, you make, you're making a, cho a choice. So what does that leading mean? How do you do the ask, the seek, the knock? So that can be very different for all of us, depending on the kind of cultures we belong. For some of us, for some cultures, it is actually going in finding someone, dating them, and maybe getting married to them. For some, it may be marrying the person their parents bring them. For others, it may be going and approaching someone directly. For some, it may be going to a pastor and asking if there are any uh, 
uh, any proposals or it may be going to a matrimonial site and finding someone so all of this seeking lead seeking asking knocking can be done uh, you know you're doing it with with the lord's favor the lord's guidance through the, through it so how do you make that decision making that decision to marry someone is a we we look at it as a collective of a couple of things one is the leading of the holy spirit <clears throat> so to to really think with your head and not just with your heart right maybe you find someone very very attractive and immediately you feel oh this is the right person but then taking a step back asking the holy spirit to give you a mind to reason to really look to see how compatible this person is so leading of the holy spirit the second is following god's word there are some things that are non negotiable in the word that god's word tells you to do right to to uh, to be yoked to a believer right to th those are some non negotiables that are there right and also using your wisdom using your judgment and using the counsel of other people or your mentors okay people who love you people who are concerned about you it's doing that so it's a combination of these three being led by the holy spirit following what god's word says and seeking that counsel the judgment and the wisdom from others and and what god has given you so that's how you come to that place of seeking doing the the, the seeking okay Okay, there's an example. What's the role of premarital counseling in marriage? Uh, it has a very, very significant role, and uh, that's something that, as APC, we definitely do follow, where we um, take our couples through through a four to six month period of preparation, where we take them through this book and uh, uh, get them to practically discuss different areas of uh, of marriage. So. Uh, it's in that through that uh, through those sessions you're actually helping the couple understand one another understanding the design that god has for marriage what would he like to see in a marriage and how as a couple we stand in alignment with that okay even though there may be differences and things are coming to a place of discussing that so yes premarital counseling is huge and and very effective in in marriage all right okay um so again uh, i think we we spoke about this uh, a little bit about how do we discern god's guidance how we how do we look look at god's gu guidance some of the scriptures that we want to bring up is um romans chapter 12 verse 2 it says do not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so uh discerning god's wisdom is yes listening to the holy spirit listening to the will of god the wisdom of god the understanding of god and as well renewing your mind so having your mind renewed in accordance to god's word all right so let's say um when, when you're doing the seeking or when when you're when you're asking the lord for for guidance uh, you see a certain trait in the person you want to marry as something that has that's probably violated god's law or 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 what god has written in scripture that's the way that he's he's sharing he's he's telling you uh, he's putting you in step with what he wants right so how do you discern that so everything that you see or everything that you come across you go back going to the holy spirit and saying god where do you want me in this so maybe he's uh, the holy spirit says you know forgive forgive and let go and uh, continue to observe the person or it says maybe this is not the right one for you or you know there are two, three four occasions where something has been violated so he's probably bringing certain things to you so it's about discerning discerning is about lead being led by the holy spirit as well as renewing your mind in accordance to god's word okay so as you're seeking um guidance about about this let's th there are some things that you need to follow and here are a few things one is does the person have the traits and the qualities that i want that is important to me and that's what i was telling that's the example that i gave you right if you if you are able to see that there isn't uh, uh some qualities that you're looking for 
then it's a discerning that God is asking you to do. Second, is there alignment and compatibility in all the areas? Uh, spiritual, emotional, uh, physical, as well as life's calling. Next, is a person prepared? Um, is the person ready or can this be addressed properly? So is the person ready for marriage? Do you see that actually happening? Are there any warning signs that you see and have they been addressed? If you see certain warning signs, like for example, uh, let's say um, while, you're dis while you're having conversations with this person, you found that they are keeping away some important truths from you. They may not be lying, but they're not telling you some things that are important to understand. Like, for example, I'm just giving you, I'm just giving you very random examples. You're probably talking about finances, and um, they have not told you about any of the debts that they have. Right? Or you're discussing about marriage, and they're not telling you that they have probably been married once. Right? So these, these are, or they are going through um, some situation, maybe they have lost a job, they haven't completed their degree, none of this is being shared with you, right? So these can be warning signs, maybe you find out through some other source, these can be certain warning signs that God is helping you to discern. Next, is there a leading in your spirit given by the Holy Spirit? Do you have God's peace about this? Is there a settling in your mind about the person, about what you are seeing? Is that there? Next, are there any external indicators where you have seen God's hand at work in guiding you to this? Maybe things have sorted out, or you know, um, it probably took, it didn't take too much of time to actually connect with the person. The person agreed to meet and talk to you. Whatever there may, may have been certain signs where uh, you know things worked out well, or is it mutual? Are both ready? for this, are, are both willing to say yes to this. Is there support and approval from others um, uh, in this? So, uh, and, and, and what, we, what we need to understand is sometimes there may not be approval. There have been cases where the, maybe the a couple have agreed and they have, uh, they, are, they are sure about moving ahead, but they have not got approval uh, uh, from their parents. So in these cases, um, especially when it matters on, on faith, like for example, uh, you may be coming from a background where your parents are not, not followers of, of Jesus or not believers, right? But you are standing in the Lord and you have found someone who who also is a believer and, and who is compatible, but your parents are not willing because of the faith. All right. So when your importance is to the faith, your importance is to having a spouse who is a believing spouse. And in some of those cases, approval doesn't happen. All right. So God may, God wants you to discern through that. And last, um, your those who are your mentors, those, those who oversee things in your life, how do they support? How do they? Uh, uh, how do they see this? So these are some of the factors that you will look for as you uh, as you are doing that discerning of the kind of person to marry. All right. Okay. There's a question. Uh, so okay, Diksha, it's your question. Okay, as you shared about premarital time through APC publication, when two person comes with choice or decision to get married. But after going through APC publication, they find that this person is not according to God's will. In this case, what decision should be taken? What do you think? Huh? Politely let the other person know. Okay. Politely let the other person know. So that has happened many times that when people have gone through premarital counseling and have found that there have been times that they have been incompatible and they have uh, decided to break away the, the the relationship or break away the engagement because it hasn't stepped further and and it is okay to do so because in premarital counseling what you're doing is not to getting two people to uh, you know even if there are these 
um, um, warning signs to to step aside from that. It is if you do see those warning signs to bring it up and to um, respectfully disconnect from the relationship. Okay. All right. Okay. So next, what do we do while you're in the waiting? Now, how many of us are waiting for marriage? Okay. Very good. All right. So what do you do in the waiting? Sorry? What will you do in the waiting? Yeah. Uh, right partner. Okay. So you're waiting for the right partner. What should you be doing now? Praying. You should be faithful in what God has called you to do. Right? All because, like, when you don't have a job, what are you doing? You're looking for a job, right? But you're you're going ahead and doing other things that you require, right? You're taking care of your home. You're taking care of you're having a bath. You're eating your food. You're not you're not fasting all till you get a job. No, you're you're going ahead and doing things that you're called to do. So keep joyful. Don't go without with a sad face. All right, be joyful. And continue to do things that is entrusted to you, to you in faith. So when you wait, waiting is not a passive time. It's not a time of inactivity. It's a time of activity. This is a time that God's called you to do many things. And so go ahead and do it even while you are looking forward to getting married. Yes, your preparation, someone said preparation. Yes. It is important to continue, keep preparing yourself, but don't despair. Keep moving on. Have the faith, be joyful, and keep moving on. Okay? All right. There was a question. Is it okay to keep our will before God to get married to a specific person? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You can you can bring God wants to know your desires and your heart. You can bring it to God. But also be open to God to, 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 yeah, to give up also if he's, if he doesn't lead you to that person or that person says no or things aren't matching, you can be willing to step it aside and move on. All right? Okay. So let's look at um, marriage. So. When you're, when you know, there is a lot of focus that is put on the day of marriage. You know, people getting married, they focus a lot on that day what I should wear, what we should eat, what guests should come, what is the color code, what are the flowers, what should my parents, right? There's so much of uh, focus on that. But marriage is just more than that wedding day. That will come and go. That's only for how many hours? Five hours? All together, five, six hours, that's it. Three days, huh? wow, okay. Okay, for you, that's three days, okay. It's three days. But then there is 30 and 60 years of your life that you have to live with the person. All right, so that, that so the focus, uh, that it doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, take time to plan and prepare. It's a, it's a great day in your life. You know, it's good to do the preparation, but there is a greater preparation. That is for life, of learning how to live together uh, with the person. All right. So as we said, marriage is more. It's, it's more than finding the right person. OK? It is, it is really about your preparations. OK. So what do you do at the engagement period? And sometimes I think engagements can be some months long. Right? So what do we do at the engagement period? What are the guidelines that we need to focus on through that engagement period? Pray. Pray for each other. OK, wonderful. Anything else that you have to have a guideline on? Get to know each other better. OK, good. OK, this is a guideline that uh, has to be specified, which is no sex before marriage. Right? What does the Bible say? Honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. So 
even though you are engaged, it's not a license for sexual intimacy. You are not married until you are married. I think it's written somewhere. Yeah, it's a. You are not married until you are married. Right? So being able to keep those boundaries, especially sexually during engagement, is very important. Um, the standards for those of us in ministry is much higher. What do I mean? That is when you are engaged, the standard for those of us who are in ministry is much higher because you should be a role model to those, to others. Right? So, because people watch you and say, oh, if that person could do it, why can't I do it? So people are watching how you conduct yourself during your engagement period, right? So you uh, you are um, you you should hold yourself to a higher higher standard. Okay, yeah. So until you're married, you're not married. Now this just this just doesn't mean in the sexual part of it. Um, a lot of times when people are engaged, they almost act as if they're married. Right? They stay together. They they spend all time together. Money becomes, you know, um, you know, there isn't boundaries about money. All of that happens, and what happens? All the decisions that you make will be because I'm not coming to church because I have to go to my fiance's whatever. I don't know slumber party. I don't know. Whatever, right? So everything becomes about the other person before marriage. So don't play married. And uh, and it's important to also, like, like Diksha, you, you spoke about this. Um, what are some signs that you know that a breakup is, that a breakup of an engagement is needed? And let's just look at that. When the other person can become very, very dominating, uh, can you give me examples of that? Okay, extreme possessiveness. Some okay, give me an example. Uh, don't go here, don't wear that, don't talk to this person, don't call the other person. You tell me before you're going, take my permission, right? Is that authoritative? Sorry, Nelson. Wear this, wear that. Yeah. If the phone is busy, okay, doubting, okay, or or questioning someone, all right, yes, right. So these are when there isn't needed freedom that is given. You kind of feel that they are yours and you can use them uh, to to do whatever you want, right? So that's thing. Yes, uh, Sam, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So actually, uh, this is like an observation uh, amongst a lot of younger youth, right? Uh, so I'm talking about 20, uh, the age range of 25 to 30. Um, okay. And like, I think the tendency in the urban city is uh, there's a lot of this casual um, uh, channels, right? Like, uh, you know, whether it's chatting or chat apps like that. And I think, and they're spending a lot of time there. Mm. Um, and and sometimes it can be a blurred line where they're emotionally invested, and and time is just gone like that, right? So, you know, what what is what do we say like to you know people who do this a lot, or say from God's word, you know, to provide a framework? Because we did that series early early in the year. And one of the things that came out of it was this. And I felt we didn't address it. So I just thought, OK, maybe if we readdress it, how do we um, address it? Yeah. So uh, so I think uh, thanks for the question, Sam. So the the idea about about, you know, a time of engagement to marriage is also a time where you need to have personal boundaries. Now, these personal boundaries would mean in every aspect of, of a life, which means uh, emotional boundaries, uh, sp um, physical boundaries, uh, sexual boundaries, financial boundaries, 
right? This is important because of the fact that, you know, you're responsible for what is given to you. And whenever, like you said, when a blur happens, then there is, uh, and usually when this blur can happen when it's in a private setting, like, like when uh, over a text and over messages, is when you're not under the scrutiny of other people. So you are the one who has to manage your own house. And that becomes a challenge for people because no one else is watching. It's just you and maybe your fiancé. Uh, and, and I think that's the, that is a great indication about where our heart is. So there, there may not be things that we can institute as, let's say, as, as a setting. I mean, if I see two people, let's say, uh, 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 two people engaged to be married, living together, Maybe that's something that someone would be able to see and and uh, help them understand that's not according to God. But something like this is a very private thing. And that is why each person needs to know their boundaries, setting those boundaries that are extremely important. And that's the that's a personal call. That's a, that's something that uh, the Holy Spirit will nudge you about. And if you do not get into that, yes, you're leading yourself to a place of sin. Um, so, because it's so private in nature. Yes. Okay. I think to what Sam asked, uh, it is always wise to, you know, uh, uh, log on or, you know, reach out to, you know, either a matrimonial bureau or a matrimonial site rather than reaching out uh, via this dating apps and other social media. Because uh, not necessarily all who are into dating apps have the intent to get married. Hmm. So that's not a platform directly. But I think the question that he was asking was about mainly about social media, social media like actually. WhatsApp, uh, and you uh. know each other, and then you know that's where it happens. So, so yeah, so those boundaries are to be set, I think, by the person, the people involved, right? Uh, personal boundaries that need to be set. Uh, when okay, Daniel, you asked when you are telling personal boundaries, can we tell everything about us without any boundaries? So, uh, Daniel, I think it's important to share things that a person needs to know, right? Uh, or, or a person, like, especially through this preparation, there may be certain things that uh, are important for us to talk and discuss about uh, for the sake of making a decision about marriage so uh yeah so that's that's important again i think to use discernment and wisdom on what you're sharing like for example you know things like and and i and i'm and i'm just going to be very open about this is where young people are talking to each other through the night they're talking about what they're wearing you know what is you know what what is going on so all of that are moving away from boundaries because that is something that you're slipping in to a place of sin. So what is needed uh, to to bring about an understanding of the other person, I, I trust is something you should discuss about, especially if there are signs or or things that can cause problems later in a uh, in the in a in a marriage. Like let's say for example, you've had relationships prior to the um to the marriage or to the to your engagement and not uh, you don't have to get into significant details you know minute kind of details but really letting people know that yeah there have been relationships what how long it lasted uh you know what's the uh, how what happened for it to break off what, how you have broken off, what is the commitment you have made, all those are important because at a later point of time, it can come out as a, as, as a challenge, as, as a situation. I know of certain couples who have said, you know, just let me know if you've had a relationship and that's all I want to know. I don't want to know anything further than that. If that's, if that's the way that they'd like to keep it, then that's fine. So it, I think it really depends on uh, a couple of as to the depth of going into some of this, but these some of this is important for people to also make a decision. Maybe there are uh, some who get into marriage 
wanting someone who has not had a prior relationship. So when you withhold that information, and you know it comes to comes to light after marriage, it can create a whole lot of mistrust after that. So really, this a, a discussion about this is what uh, a mutual discussion when people do want to know is definitely something that is needed. All right. Uh, Okay, so there's another question. If we know it's God's will, do we need to question the other person or believe God? Daniel, I'm sorry that your question is not clear. If we know it's God's will, do we need to question the other person or believe God? You need to have the, the consent of the other person, definitely, to, to get married. So even as you believe God, uh, and I think that's what we spoke about, to have the approval and the consent of the other person. So if you do have the consent of the other person and a lot of other factors that we were talking about match, uh, I think your maybe the situation won't occur. I don't know if I've misread your question. Okay, you said okay. All right. Okay. Um, so we were looking at what are some of the signs of a breakup. So the first one we said was, if the person is very controlling. The second one is if the person is very dependent on you emotionally. You know, they're always looking to you to feel happy, to take away their sadness, to bring about joy. All of that can be very, very unhealthy. It can be emotionally draining for you as a person. The next one is if there is, uh, they fail to take responsibilities. Can make having a job, keeping financial commitments, keeping other commitments. If that is not there, that could be a sign for a breakup. Many differences become visible, like your spiritual maturity, the way that your intimacy with God, your calling. If you see very, very huge differences, that can be a sign. If there are problems in the character, that's again another sign. And if there is significant disapproval of parents or spiritual mentors, um, apart from maybe the reason of faith, uh, that's again maybe another breakup sign. Okay, um, another question. It's becoming a trend to have a health profile screening of the couples to understand any genetic disorder or diseases. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah that's okay. Yeah. yeah, so is that okay? So I do, I do see, you all have the question? It's becoming a trend to have a health profile screening of the couples to understand any genetic disorder or diseases. In fact, uh, I want to go a step further. There are profiles of whether a person is fertile or not. Even that happens. Is it OK? And any thoughts here? Yeah? It's a very lopsided question, simply because one, uh, it breaks the trust of the other person. Okay. If one has to look at it a very close level, like you asking me to do that and then say yes, that could be one thought process. But on the other side, it is in a way, it's better to get it done and not have those doubts in your mind and then try to get into it and then rediscover later and then retrace it back. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's a very dicey question. Okay. All right. Anyone else has some thoughts? I want you to think these are. Wonderful questions. Thank you for that question. What do you all think? You all understood the question, right? No. Then you should ask. The question is that now, when people get married, they want them to do blood checkups to see if there is any, dis yeah, any disposition to a disease or a disorder, right? Or they will do certain tests to see if the person is um, able to have children. So she's asking, is it OK? I mean, he's asking, is it OK? Biju is asking, is it OK? But then this generally becomes like a decision factor. Like if I see that you have potential to have cancer if you have diabetes then i don't want to get married to you so that's it's that's basically that 
OK, so I mean, again, this is a personal question. I don't have any scriptural reference to this. I think this is a very ethical um, uh, thing of, and also moving into people's personal uh, space and private space, right? Uh, and also playing the hand of God, right? Because you're saying, if you don't, so my, my question always is if that's what you're doing, what if after marriage you fall sick? You know, what happens? I mean, all your parameters are perfect till you get married, and suddenly after that they fall sick. What happens then? So, we're what we're attempting to do here, my personal thoughts are we're playing God, we are trying to have the perfect. Uh, you know, person to be married to without really looking at, you know, God has a grander scheme for life and marriage and togetherness. And allowing God to do His work is far greater than us trying to maneuver and manipulate His hand in it. So, personally, I don't think it is okay. I'm, you all may differ with me, but that's my personal stand. Okay. What is your thought, Biju? What do you think, I'm Biju? Speaking. I am thinking on the same lines, ma'am. <laughs> you can explain further. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's what, uh, you know, God has a plan for uh, everyone. And uh, we don't know what is... Uh, what uh, we have in store before us. So let us leave everything to God's hands. And according to Romans 8, 28, everything happens uh, you know, for our good. So that's what my thought. OK, thank you. All right. All right, nice, nice questions. OK, so let's move on. Uh, how do you know if you're called to be single? What if you are called to be single? So. You know, I think something that when you look at Genesis, there is what does the Genesis Commission say? The Genesis Commission actually shows by default that marriage is to be there. That's why it says, right, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, right? So that is the commission. However, uh, many people may not take that path, may decide to stay single and we just want to bring about some some things that the bible talks about when it comes to singleness one singleness should be a choice that you make for purposes of god for purposes of of king of the kingdom okay if you look at matthew chapter 19 verse 12 it says some from birth seemingly never give marriage a thought others never get asked or accepted and some decide not to get married for kingdom purposes but if you're capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. So there may be many reasons why some may choose to be single. But what is pointed out here by God, by Jesus, is that you decide not to get married if it is for kingdom purposes, if, if you would want to do things to serve God. You want to choose to spend your time, your energy, your money, all that you have for the work of God, right? That should be one of the reasons why you're choosing to be single rather than being broken hearted, being not finding the right person. It is should be for kingdom purposes. Next, singleness is a gift, OK? And here's what Paul talks about it. You, we, we all know that Paul remains single. Right? And he speaks about, he explains that the ability to stay single is a gift. It's not for everyone. And it's something that, that comes only from God. Will someone read that? That verse that is there against that? 7, 9, and uh, 28? Yeah. Uh, First Corinthians, remember? Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes I wish everyone were single like me, a simpler life in many ways. But celibacy is not for everyone any more than marriage is. God gives the gift of the single life to some, the gift of the married life to others. I do, though, 
tell the unmarried and widows that singleness might well be the best thing for them as it has been for me but if they can't manage their desires and emotions they should by all means go ahead and get married the difficulties of marriage are preferable by far to a sexually tortured life as a single but there's certainly no sin in getting married whether you're a virgin or not all i am saying is that when you marry you take an additional stress in an already stressful time and i want to spare you if possible okay so what is paul saying here is paul saying that marriage is better than being single or single is better than being married what is uh, being married what is he saying here students yeah what is what is paul saying here is one better than the other given a choice because of all the stressful uh, life that we are actually leading and if you still call to be single or you feel to be single it's okay oh. but if uh, not if you cannot urge that uh, desires within you and uh, other things and you need that thing please go ahead and get married and it is just an additional uh, thing but he gives that uh, thing it is not demanding like from god as such to be single okay and the thing. so he's not putting one above the it's, other right. it's in similar standing it's not that if you're married you're better or if you're single you're better and that's a i think that's a very important truth for single people to understand because in a social construct if you're not married something's wrong you're not you're looked down upon but what is god what is what is paul saying paul is saying that either in the status of marriage or in the status of singlehood both have equal standing right if you are called to be single well and good if not well and good all right so it's a gift singleness is a gift it's something that only god can empower you to be and also so in in other words it's also saying i mean god has all, uh, said that that you know marriage is a good thing right so we do not look down on any one of these states but choose to respect whatever decision people have made however single being single should be for the purposes of god and also to focus on things of god to pay being and paying attention to to what god wants you to do to serve god okay so it is not a inferior way of being single an uh, inferior way than being than being single all right so how do you know if you are called to a life of singleness ask yourself these two these three questions are you empowered and have the strength to remain single for the rest of your life which means you're choosing to be on your own for the rest of your lives do you know that there is a specific calling that god has for you is there a specific calling for which that if you do get married you would not be able to pursue that calling as freely and third do you feel that you are in a place that you want to devote all of your time your resources your abilities your energies in pursuing that service to god if you have an answer to these three which is a positive yes go ahead and continue to stay single if not go back to chapter 2 and chapter 3 read them write down your expectations do the seeking seek god discern find the person get married amen someone said asapu said amen <laughs> okay all right okay any questions on what we looked at today no questions today okay what should he do what should he, what do you think so vimal's question is if if uh, the son is the only son of his parents and the parents want him to get married but the son wants to pursue um, service to god what should he do that was his question come on help your brother 
Huh? Louder, Sapu, come on. Stick to his decision. Okay, stick to your decision. Okay. Anyone else's other thoughts? Sugad. Huh? Stick to your decision. Okay. Ah. Okay. Okay, all right. So that's what Asapu says that if, if someone's calling is to be single to serve God, they should follow it. And uh, yeah, and the parents may be upset, but the calling of God is important, is what Asapu said. Anyone else has any differing thoughts? Got your answer? Yeah, okay. Any other question? Okay, if not, we'll close. I want somebody from the class to pray, other than Akin. Komal, you prayed last week? No. Okay, go ahead. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this time, O oh Lord. Thank you for uh, that we help, you helped us to learn many things from uh, this book, O oh Lord. Uh, help us to understand all these things or the responsibility uh, after marriage and after, uh, and many of the people are uh, going prepare in the preparation period, help them to uh, do preparation, O oh Lord, and you help them, guide them, give them uh, guidance, O oh Lord, in every time. Thank you for hearing our prayer and other, pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. See you all next week. God bless. Thank you.